Good evening, everyone. So to those of you here in the chapel and those of you who are listening live online and those of you who watch the recording later, welcome to all of you to the 15th annual Manchester Wesley Research Center annual lecture. I'm Jordan Hammond, the director of the Manchester Wesley Research Center. First of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the International Board of Education of the Church of the Nazarene for their generous sponsorship of uh, this lecture, which uh, they have been doing for uh, many years now. And I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize the 16 partner institutions that together make up the MWRC. The MWRC is a working partnership between these institutions, each of which are actively engaged in research in the Methodist, Wesleyan, uh, and Evangelical traditions. Uh, in Argentina, Universidad del Centro Educativo Latino Americano. In Canada, Ambrose University and Tyndale University Cliff College, the John Rylands Library, Nazarene Theological College, and the University of Manchester Religions and Theology uh, subject area. In the USA, Asbury Theological Seminary, Asbury University, the International Board of Education of the Church of the Nazarene, um, based in the USA but representing globally uh, Nazarene higher education, Nazarene Theological Seminary, Northwest Nazarene University, Pentecostal Theological Seminary, Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, Point Loma Nazarene University, and Wesley Seminary at Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, and it's nice to have representatives from a number of those institutions with us this evening. So this is really the intellectual, the spiritual, the financial contributions of the partner institutions that brought the MWRC and into existence. And the partner institutions and the faculty and the students at them, um, including many of you who are here tonight, have made tonight's lecture possible. This occasion also gives me an opportunity to publicly thank the MWRC team. Professor David Bundy, uh, Associate Director of the Center, uh, is serving in his third year in that role. And he's really been a great help to me uh, and blessed us here with uh, his presence in Manchester during that time and uh, continues to teach us through his research on the holiness uh, movements in the UK in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Professor Howard Snyder, formerly the visiting director of the MWRC, now international representative of the center, continues to represent the center through uh, his travels, his writing and speaking engagements. Helen Stalker has faithfully served as MWRC assistant with a particular responsibility for looking after the MWRC Special Collection Library uh, over the last six years. And she helps with organizing events as well, like tonight's annual lecture. Uh, Fernando Carvalho, also, who has been a, a, a volunteer MWRC postgraduate assistant over this last academic year, has had a particular focus on uh, cataloging books for the MWRC library. And Alex Parrish is also an MWRC postgraduate assistant uh, for the third year in that role. And he's particularly been uh, responsible for the MWRC website and uh, social media. So really want to thank uh, these five colleagues. Uh, the MWRC could not have expanded in the number of ways that it has uh, over the last several years uh, without their support and help. I have the honor uh, and the pleasure to introduce this year's lecturer, Dr. Chris Green. Dr. Green is professor of theology at Southeastern University, a liberal arts university of the Assemblies of God 
Uh, he is young, as you will see, but uh, he has lots of impressive experience on his uh, CV already in terms of teaching uh, and publications. Over the last decade, he's taught at several other schools, including Pentecostal Theological Seminary in Tennessee, Oral Roberts University, and Southwestern Christian University, both in Oklahoma. He's author of several books, and you can find uh, several of them in uh, the foyer uh, on, uh, and look at them on after the lecture. Toward a Pentecostal Theology of the Lord's Supper, Sanctifying Interpretation, Vocation, Holiness, and Scripture, The Promise of Robert W. Jensen's Theology, Constructive Engagements, uh, and that's co-edited with uh, Steve uh, Wright here from Nazarene Theological College. The End of Music, a Companion to Robert Jensen's Theology, and Surprised by God, How and Why What We Think About the Divine Matters. Chris serves uh, as teaching pastor at the Sanctuary Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he is also a visual artist. So he lives with his wife, uh, Julie, in Lakeland, Florida, and has three children. Now, on a personal level, myself and uh, several others of us connected to the MWRC have been in contact with Chris in um, a number of different capac capacities. Uh, he's co-supervising a doctoral student at the University of Manchester, NTC. And uh, as well, we've had contact through the American Academy of Religion recently, uh, where Chris gave a paper at um, an inaugural session uh, titled Holiness and Pentecostal Movements, Intertwined Pasts, Presents, and Futures. And this was the first session of an ongoing project of the Manchester Wesley Research Center and Pentecostal Theological Seminary. And if you're interested in that, the audio recordings of the papers from that session are available through the MWRC YouTube page. Now, from conversation with Chris over the last few days, um, understand that his lecture tonight is part of a wider project that he's working on on the problem of evil. And so it's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Green to present his lecture titled The Fall of Wisdom, Reflections on Evil and the Purposes of God. Thanks, Chris. Good evening. It's good to be here. I, at least for me, it's good to be here. I love Manchester. It's my first time. I've been to the UK several times, but not to Manchester. I love the city and love the college. It's a beautiful campus. That has a lot to do with the fact that I now live in Central Florida, and it's summertime. And no one wants to be in Central Florida in summertime. You're from Orlando. You know what I mean. Florida is too, too hot in the summer and too bright in the summer and too bugged in the summer and too alligatored in the summer. So to get to come to Manchester, it's, it's wonderful. And I, it's, it's been true of me for a long time that three or more days of sunshine and I fall into deep depression. <laughs> Manchester has cured me of all of that. No risk of three days of sunshine. When I received the email from Jordan offering me the invitation, I was thinking about the problem of evil. I don't mean around the time he sent me the email. I mean when I opened the email, I was in the process of thinking about the problem of evil. And so I responded with, I think I'll talk about the problem of evil. I always make rash decisions like that. Once I'd made the commitment, I realized I had to actually write something about the problem of evil. And, well, you'll, you'll be the judge of whether or not that was a good decision. But just know it was made rashly. I made it in the heat of the moment because that's what I was thinking about at the time when he, when he asked. And I finished writing this about eight minutes before five, seven or eight minutes before five, because Steve made me print it. Or I would still be in his office rewriting it. So it's nothing else. It's fresh. So I, I grew up, I, I teach at a Pentecostal school now, but I grew up in Pentecostal churches, and 
they prized fresh words from God, by which they meant words that had not been studied at all. <laughs> it was spontaneous, thoughtless is another way. If you were less charitable, you might refer to it. Off the top of the head or in the spirit, again, depending on whose perspective we're taking. But this is fresh, so it may not make sense, but it is at least new. I, this is, I've shared it with no one else, right? This, this is new for you. I am tired. I, my body is still not quite caught up um, from the trip. But I'm not as tired as my Romans professor in undergrad who had years before he taught us videotaped his lectures. And when he came to class, he would play videotapes of those previous lectures and he would sleep. <laughs> I promise you I won't do that. You can sleep, but I'm not going to sleep during this lecture, and I'm not going to videotape it. And I have tried to make it as controversial as I can without severing my relationship with Manchester and NTC, because I, somebody has to save me from Florida in the summer, and I need to maintain this relationship at all possible. That was a joke. That was <laughs> just... Rowan Williams has written an astonishing essay on what he calls the anti-theology of Julian of Norwich. You, you may have seen it. In which he says she, in her work, tries to unfamiliarize the familiar in hopes of pruning back the theological tree, cutting away the dead limbs for the sake of new growth. Pruning the dead limbs for the sake of new growth. I'm not Julian, nor the son of a Julian, but that's what I'm trying to do in this lecture. This is a, an attempt at pruning, an attempt at cutting back for the sake of new growth. I don't want to be challenging or controversial or difficult. I do want to be odd. I, I will be succeeding if at, at least once in the lecture you're not quite sure what I'm saying. Now, if at every point in the lecture you're not quite sure what I'm saying, then that's not success. But I, I do want to, to be odd, and I, I want you to know right up front that this is an attempt to be odd, to say some familiar things in unfamiliar ways. My hope is that when I'm done, we won't have different doctrines, but we will be thinking about our doctrines differently. I'm not introducing new doctrines, but I am hoping to find ways of talking about doctrines we've known all of our lives that need to be reconsidered, that need fresh language and new concepts to, art, to be articulated well for this moment. And I hope that we can have a robust and truly enjoyable conversation when I'm done, or at least that you don't hurt me. Right? That's the set the bar low. So the paper, just enough prefacing, uh, it, the paper is, has five parts. First, there's an introduction to the theology of evil. Then a quick sketch of Augustine's view, which has been dominant in the tradition. Then an even quicker sketch of Wesley's view. And then the fourth section takes up the bulk of the paper, which is a laying out of a kind of alternative to that view, a constructive proposal. And then finally, a very brief conclusion. All the naughty bits are in the fourth section, so you can wait for that. And the conclusion is mostly about how we should live now. If, if what I've said in the fourth section makes any sense, how would that translate to the way that we do church? How would that translate to the way we live on mission or pray? So that, that will be the, the conclusion. So let's begin. I'm going to start with two lines from Julian's Revelations, which I hope will be anchors for everything else I say. That if you're not sure what I'm saying as we go through the lecture, remember these two statements and know that I'm not saying anything, or at least I'm trying not to say anything that strays from those commitments. So here are the two statements. They're both brief. The first one is, our Lord God doeth all. 
Our Lord God doeth all. And the second one is God is the midpoint of all. Our Lord God doeth all, which comes pretty early in the Revelations. And then God is the midpoint of all, which comes pretty late. But these two lines are the text for this not sermon. But you get the point. It's always risky to summarize the history of Christian doctrines, but I'm going to try it anyway. In terms of the doctrine of creation, Christian theologies of evil traditionally have affirmed, A, that God did not and indeed could not create evil. B, that evil, therefore, is a nothing, a no thing. C, that evil is a no thing actually actualized against God's will but not necessarily against his purposes. Evil is actualized against God's will, but not necessarily against his purposes. D, by the bad free choices of angels and demons, bad choices which affected the fall and its endless disasters and consequences, disastrous consequences, evil comes about. So evil comes about by bad free choices by angels and human beings, Satan and Adam. In these classical accounts, F, the created order, in spite of the fall, remains fundamentally good, as good and faithful, as a good and faithful witness to the goodness and faithfulness of God. But angels and humans are ruined, their natures stripped of goodness. Humans are not finally unredeemable, thanks to the unsurpassable kindness and creativity of God. But they are, by nature, opposed to God and godliness, wounded so profoundly by sin, they can do nothing to save themselves or protect others, including impersonal others, from the destruction they cannot not bring about. Satan and his demons, of course, remain beyond redemption. So in this classical account, again, just to summarize, God does not create evil. Evil emerges from bad free choices. Those bad free choices destroy humans and angels. Angels irreparably. Humans not irreparably because of God's mercy on them. The rest of creation, though, even though it's wounded, remains a good and faithful witness to the goodness and faithfulness of God. In terms of the doctrine of providence, that, that's the doctrine of creation. In terms of the doctrine of providence... These classic theologies of evil, as a rule, have affirmed that without in any way doing wrong, God, from the beginning, allowed and continues to allow evil in order to bring about greater good. In such a construal, God can never be said to do evil. He is goodness itself, and whatever he does is inherently right. So much so that who he is and what he does are simply identical, but he can be said to do good by doing evils, or at least to do good by using evils, to punish or restrain sin and to press faithless sinners and sinful believers toward repentance. So God does not do evil, God does not create evil, but God uses evil. And God uses evils, which is a distinction I'll use throughout the paper, to bring about good. And that, can, that good can be any number of things, but it, can, it will include the punishment of sin and the provocation of sinners toward repentance. Finally, in terms of the doctrine of salvation, these theologies of evil have affirmed that God will ultimately triumph over evil in all of its manifestations, destroying it absolutely, healing every damage done whether to human beings or to the good creation entrusted to their care. So the doctrine of evil, as I'm understanding it, really shows itself in three different aspects of the Christian theological tradition, doctrines of creation, doctrines of providence, and soteriologies, doctrines of salvation. And at the heart is this belief that God is a good God who allows evil for ultimately good purposes. Even though sin is against his will, he has a purpose for it purpose for it, and he allows it in order to bring about some greater good that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And in the end, when everything is said and done, God will destroy evil and sin, and creation will remain in the fullness of what God purposed. Pretty familiar. Most of us, I think, know that account pretty well. 
These ideas were articulated long before Augustine, but Augustine is the one who articulated them coherently and in depth. And I'm not going to read this section of the paper because I can't cover everything. Again, I think most of you will be familiar with the fact that Augustine is kind of the, the architect of this doctrine of evil. He's not the first one to come up with any one of these ideas, but he is the first one to cohere them and to articulate them at depth in opposition to what we now know are heresies like Pelagianism, Manichaeism, and so on. But I do want to talk a little bit about Wesley and Wesley's, Wesley's view, which is very similar to Augustine's. Wesley's view of, of evil is traditional, for sure. But he does have a, a couple of differences that I want to point out. Let me skip to the right spot. One of the differences is Wesley is much more optimistic about what a doctrine of evil can do than Augustine is. Augustine is very pessimistic about the possibility of theodicy. Wesley is very optimistic about the possibility of theodicy. He says in one of his sermons that the free will account so obviously and conclusively absolves God of any wrong that upon this ground we do not find it difficult to justify the ways of God to men. We do not find it difficult. So if you, if you just take the classic free will argument, which is God created creatures with the ability to do wrong, even though God does not require it of them, they have that possibility, that potential, and they take it, Lucifer first, and then Adam and Eve, and they destroy themselves and the creation in the process, but that's not on God. And for Wesley, there isn't much anguish. And I, I think this is important. As a pastor, of course, Wesley is concerned with the suffering of people. So don't mishear me here. I think there is, there is a way in which Wesley is sympathizing with people in their suffering. But as a theologian, he's not troubled much by the reflection on God of these difficulties. Right? So he's not... Modern in that way. Modern theology is, is marked, among other things, by anxiety about God in light of what God has allowed, what God has permitted to take place. And of course, that's driven by events, primarily by events that happen long after Wesley is dead, like the Holocaust. So that theology after the Holocaust is you know, how could God allow this? Right? But Wesley, you can see this in the way he talks about earthquakes. He, he just assumes that the problem is with us, not with God. Right? Look, there, there's just no part of him that's in angst about the character of God, even in the face of evil. And, and that's a, a slightly different than, than Augustine. There is a sermon, some of you probably know this, but there's a sermon in Wesley's collection that is by Charles, not John, and it's specifically on earthquakes. And he essentially says, if earthquakes come, it's because God did them. And God does earthquakes for really two reasons. He, he makes the earthquake to terrify sinners so they will repent, or to kill sinners for their sin. That's why God does what he does. And Charles, handily, wrote a hymn for it, which goes, the last stanza goes like this. The pillars of the earth are thine, and, though, and thou hast set the world thereon. They at thy sovereign word incline, the center trembles at thy frown, the everlasting mountains bow, and God is in the earthquake now. God is in the earthquake now. Of course, he's talking about the prophet's experience, the mountain being shaken and God not speaking in the shaking. And he's insisting that at Lisbon, God was speaking in the shaking, right? That this, this cataclysmic event was God saying something about the wickedness of those people. One more thing about Wesley and his doctrine of evil. He believed that most evil came about from the devil. But that most people don't realize it's coming from the devil. And the devil disguises his attacks on people so that people will blame God. So that 
The suffering that comes into our life is, is suffering that's coming at us from the, from the enemy, but the enemy does it in such a way that we're liable to turn to God in accusation. And for me personally, the most difficult of Wesley's doctrine, aspect of Wesley's doctrine of providence is his understanding of particular providence in three dimensions. So those of you who study Wesleyan theology know that he believed that providence was not general. He was not a deist, like there's a living God who sees the world and acts in the world, but that he acts in different ways depending on how close people are to them in faith. So God is least involved in the lives of the pagans. And so they're most likely to suffer because God's not going to providentially intervene for them. Christians are between the pagans who are kind of at the mercy of the world and the true believers. The Christians are close enough to God, they, they're justified by faith, they're close enough to God that they can trust that God will sometimes intervene on their behalf, but not consistently. And, and Wesley actually appeals to Jesus saying, that the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do you remember this passage? Jesus is saying this to, to encourage people, and Wesley says clearly Jesus couldn't mean that about everybody. He only means that about those who are true believers. Only true believers are given that kind of attention. So take that for what it's worth. That, for me personally, is difficult to swallow. Look, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's Wesley at his best, but there it is. And it, it has a lot to do with the way the Wesleyan tradition and all the traditions affected by Wesleyan tradition have thought about evil. And even though no one in my church growing up could have quoted that sermon, I'm not sure many of them could have named John Wesley. They did believe that doctrine of providence. I was taught that doctrine of providence by people who never read a word of John Wesley. Now, how does that happen, right? David Bundy can answer the question. That's how it happens. It, I mean, it's, it's still alive, is my point. That doctrine is still alive, that God has special attention for those who are closest to him. In terms of number of Christians, what you might know, what we call in the States the health and wealth gospel or the prosperity gospel, holds to that doctrine of providence. Again, most of those ministers have no idea that it runs back to Wesley. But it is Wesleyan nonetheless. This idea that those who are near to God have the protection of God in a way that no one else does. Like, so I heard this all the time growing up. And one of the proof text was the story of the plagues in Egypt. Right? You remember what happens? Israel is, is kept safe from, from at least some of the plagues, the worst ones. And the, the teaching was that if you stay right with God, is that language you're familiar with, staying right with God? Some, yeah. Then you're, you're safe, or at least safer than you would be if you weren't. And of course, we would work back from bad events to you must not be right with God. Right? So if you get a flat tire, you probably said a curse word that morning, like dang or heck or something horrible like that. Watch an R-rated movie. Who knows what you did? But the worse the catastrophe, the worse the sin that must be in your life to bring that about. And I think those of us who are in the Wesleyan tradition need to recognize that, that is, that's not just aberrant theology of people who associate themselves with us. That is the theology of our traditions. Right? That's not... That's not a perverted version of what we've said. That is what we've said. And for good or ill, we need to face that. Right? All right, so here's my, my counter proposal, which is, which is going to come in nine different thesis statements. I'm not going to be able to read all of these, although I was going to say it will be published. I'm not going to presume that it will be. If you email me, I can email you a copy. Of, of the paper, or we can talk about it afterwards. But there, there are nine theses, and some of them I'll talk about in depth with you, and some I'll just mention and, and, and move on. Number one, thesis number one, we cannot speak of evil. 
we cannot speak of evil. We can only speak of good and then negate what we've said. I used to say that God is mysterious and evil is absurd. I taught students this for years. God is mysterious, evil is absurd, humans are complex. That's the way that, that I would frame this problem for them. And I no longer can say that because absurdity etymologically runs back, of course, to the Latin and which it's just a word for discordance. It's a musical term for discordance. And discordance isn't ugly, not necessarily. Discordance belongs to music. So we can't really say evil is absurd because that would suggest that evil belongs to what it is that God is playing. But the Christian tradition, I think rightly, has said evil is nothing. It's not an absurd something, it's nothing. So we can't actually speak about evil. What we have to say is evil is what absurdity would be if absurdity had no goodness in it. But we have no idea what that would be because all of the absurdity we know has goodness in it. Because we never know evil. What we know is the good diminished. What we know is the good broken or inhibited in some way. The good being false to itself. But we never know evil because there's nothing there to be known. Do you hear the distinction? Right? We know good things not being the fullness of themselves. But we don't know evil. So when we speak about evil, what we're actually speaking about is the negation of some good. The absolute negation of some good. Thesis number two. All of these are, these first few are easy to take. I'll warn you when we get to the challenging ones. <laughs> Thesis number two, evil asserts itself right from the beginning. So the idea in the tradition, Karl Barth's an exception to this, but I don't want to talk about him. So other than Barth, for the most part, Christian theologians have said sin, I'm evil, not sin, evil comes about because of choices. Evil comes from choice. Lucifer made a choice. And, I mean, Wesley says it like this. Lucifer tempted himself. Lucifer tempted himself. And out of that self-temptation comes the fall. And out of that fall of Lucifer comes evil. What I want to suggest in this thesis is that evil is not something that happens after a choice, but before that evil is there from the beginning. So Proverbs 8, this was part of the lectionary reading for Sunday, is the, the cry of wisdom in which wisdom says, I won't read it to you, you know the passage, which wisdom says, I am the first of all God's creatures. I was there at the foundations of the world. And whatever God made, I was there to see him make it. So what I would want to contend, and I'm not going to read this section to you, what I would want to contend is that all created things are made by wisdom. They're created by God through wisdom. So wisdom is the first creature of God. And then all things are made with that wisdom. So that every creature has a wisdom. Tigers have a wisdom. Cheetahs have a wisdom. And they have different wisdoms. That's why we know a cheetah from a tiger. And aardvarks have a wisdom, and their wisdom is different from the cheetahs and different from the tigers, and you and I have a wisdom. And then we live that wisdom differently, of course, right? But wisdom refers to the ways in which our natures are determined. Like the, When we say something like human nature, we're saying something that wisdom made. God created human beings, wisdom gave us a particular kind of nature. So the wisdom of the weather is different here in Manchester than it is in central Florida. It's better here. You've got better wisdom in Manchester than we have in Orlando, at least during the summer. It might flip during the winter, I don't know. But what I'm wanting you to hear is that all created things have a wisdom. Weather patterns have a wisdom, planets have a wisdom, planetary systems have a wisdom, animals have a wisdom, human beings have a wisdom. 
And that wisdom is what establishes their natures. And it's that wisdom that is fallen. That evil emerges in the wisdom of things. So that things are fallen in their very nature. So let me use my examples. The weather is not what God purposed it to be. Ever, anywhere. God did not make tigers to hunt people and kill them. Now here, I may sound absurd. I'm more or less just quoting Wesley, who says that before the fall, there was no violence in the entire universe. There was no violence in the entire universe. Thomas Aquinas raises this problem and scoffs at it. And says, of course there were. God made animals to hunt. They hunted. In the Garden of Eden, tigers were eating little lambs. But I, don't, I think Wesley's right and Aquinas is wrong. I don't think that that's the way that God made things. I think the fact that we live in a world in which there are tornadoes and cyclones and hurricanes is a sign that the weather is not what God purposed it to be. The fact that we live in a world in which there are tigers that kill people is a sign that we're not in a world that God wants it to be. I say that for lots of reasons, but mostly because when we're given a vision of the eschaton, what we're given is a vision in which the lion and the lamb lie down together. So I, I would contend on a lot of fronts that violence does not belong to the order God gave to creation. But because wisdom has fallen, violence is inherent in all living things. Now, one of the things that hurts us, and this really hurts Wesley, and there's a fascinating, fascinating critique of Wesley that was published in the Westminster Journal in 1870 by a guy I can't, he just put his initials, and I cannot find out who it, who it was. So anybody, who, David, you may know. I, I don't know who the cr critic is. But he takes Wesley to task, and he says to him, says, Wesley's cosmology, that's the title of the article, Wesley's cosmology is based on his imagined reconstructions of history rather than his study of history. And he says, you can say all you want about the, about the world not being violent, but the fact is, the sciences tell us the world as we can observe it has always been violent. And one of the things I think we have to face as theologians and teachers in Christian traditions is how are we going to deal with the history of violence in the evolutionary account of the world? Theologically, how are we going to give some account of that? Because historically speaking, we didn't begin in a garden, a garden of innocence and no violence. We emerged from millennia and millennia and millennia and millennia of violence. I, there are arguments all over the place, as you probably know. There are Christians who say death isn't evil. The death of human beings in sin is evil, which is very similar to Aquinas' argument before any of this became a problem. Regardless, we have to face it and deal with it. I'm, I'm, I, I have my own take, but I don't need to share that right now. What I want to stress for what I'm going to say in the next few minutes is that wisdom has fallen and therefore everything else has fallen at its heart. Now, this is a departure from Wesley and Augustine and the tradition, because the Wesleyan and Augustinian tradition talks about the total depravity of the human, but they don't believe in the total depravity of creation. And so think about how many times you've heard people say, see something beautiful in nature, a sunrise or whatever else, and say, that's the glory of God. I'm saying we shouldn't say that. I'm saying we can't say that without qualification. Because the world is not what God intended it to be. The weather is not, animals are not, and so on. Number three. Evil does not emerge from a choice, but is the counter determining of the context determining reality for all choices. So again. My argument, and this is where the title of the lecture comes from, is that wisdom has fallen. And because wisdom has fallen, all creatures are vulnerable.
Satan makes the choice he makes. Lucifer makes the choice he makes because there's already evil there at work on him. Now, theologically and philosophically, there is no answer to where did evil come from. There, there isn't one. You really have the choice of either Lucifer tempted himself, which is what Wesley said, and he created evil in his own heart, or evil somehow self-generated. Either way, we can't explain it. Because if we could explain it, we would justify it. And this is why what I'm trying to offer you right now is not a theodicy. It's a theology of evil, but it's not a theodicy. You remember Wesley said, it is not difficult to justify the ways of God to men. What I believe is the moment you try to justify the ways of God to men, you end up justifying evil. In order to defend God, you have to say evil isn't really evil. It has a purpose. But if evil has a purpose... Is it really evil anymore? If evil can be made to do good, isn't that good? If evil is something God needs to get done what God wants to get done in the world, then how can it really be evil? And I want to get as strong a, a, a kind of a strong denial of that as possible said. I think that this is clear in the jo Johannine tradition, which is, which is surprising that Wesley didn't pick up on it, but in the Johannine textual tradition, we have these two statements that I think are meant to parallel each other. One is, Satan is a liar from the beginning. He's a liar from the beginning. And the lamb is slain from the foundations of the world. Creation from the foundations needs salvation. Now, here's why I think this matters. I mean, there are lots of reasons, but here's, here's one of the main ones. I think it's damaging to people to be told a story that says choice is what destroyed all this. Free choice is what destroyed all this. It's like blaming kids for the divorce. Lucifer made a bad choice. Adam, Eve made bad choices but they made bad choices in the context of evil. I mean, think about the Garden of Eden. Think about what's taking place there. I mean, we have kind of Sunday school readings of that text, but if you just pay a little bit of attention to what's happening in the text, you realize there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil before anybody does anything. And there is a command not to eat of it before anybody does anything. And there is a serpent who's tempting them before anybody does anything. And Eve has a desire in her heart, a readiness already in her. to be. She's drawn to a tree. I mean, think about the story tells you. What the, all we get in the narrative, we don't get, you know, if I'd written Genesis, you get long, long stories about what Adam and Eve were not, not the kind Augustine tells in the Confessions. That's entirely inappropriate. But the... <laughs> Uh, you get long stories about what Adam and Eve were doing before they got to the tree. But the way the text actually reads, it's like they've been created for two minutes. And Eve is like, look at that tree. And she's there and she takes it. And where's Adam? Why isn't he saying something to her? And then as soon as they're confronted, Adam disavows her. Because even in Eden, marriage isn't Edenic. You realize their marriage is broken before she takes the fruit. They're already not engaging each other. They're, he's already ready to just give up on her. He's as quick to deny her as she was to run to the tree. The point of the Genesis narrative is not that things were swell and perfect. It's that even in a perfect situation, evil asserts itself. It asserts itself powerfully. And overwhelmingly. So I think part of what we need here is to reconsider the place of choice. So one of the things that I say to my students is, so I had this great experience. Before I did the PhD, I did a doctor in ministry. And I had one class that was just outstanding. And it started this way. This man came in. It was a psychology class. But he was 
a pretty astute, theologically trained professor. He came in on the first day of class. Of course, we've read, you know, 50 books or whatever and written all of our papers. And here class begins, and he comes in with all of our papers in his hands, and he walks up to the table at the front, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, throws them down on the table, and says, I thank God none of you are my pastors. Because you think every problem in the world is the result of somebody's choice. That changed my life. To be confronted with the ways in which I was thinking, yes, everything comes back to choice. Our theologies say that it does, and they shouldn't. Evil does not emerge from a choice. Evil is what coerced bad choices in the first place. People are sinned against. That's why they're sinners. They're sinned against. That's why they sin. And if you take the other way around, you will, you'll, in my opinion, you'll always end up blaming people for their problems. If they just made better choices, they wouldn't be there. If they made better choices, they wouldn't be poor. If they made better choices, they wouldn't be divorced. If they made better choices, they'd still have a job. And I think we say those kinds of things cruelly because our theology at its heart is cruel. It's, it's at its heart, it's already suggesting that this comes down to choice. In a perfect world, we still messed it up. That's the narrative we tell. All right, I'm preaching now, sorry. Um, thesis four. Everybody still okay? Right. Those of you who still are, thank you for that. Because of what evil does to wisdom and what wisdom does to nature, Nature cannot be trusted as an authoritative witness to God's will. I, I want to talk about this in relation to several things. Um, this is the longest section of the paper, and I can't cover all of it. This is a, a pretty challenging idea, but challenging in terms of it runs counter to what I think we've assumed. I think there are a lot of practices and beliefs that we hold that are rooted in natural theologies, that are never really examined. And I don't think we should just do away with natural theologies. I'm not saying that you can't do natural theology. I'm saying we need to re-examine our natural theologies. Because I think we believe that there are some things that are what God wants them to be, and we can therefore look at them and work backward from that to what God must want. And I don't think that's how God reveals his will to us. I don't think he creates things, gives us those things, and then lets those things fall so that we can then look to those things to see what he wants. I think he reveals his will to us in Jesus and in the scripture that witnesses to Jesus and the church that proclaims that scripture. And that, that is basic to, to what I'm going to say, to say next. Nature is not a witness to God's will, not an authoritative witness. Nature is a witness. Nature is not an authoritative witness. And, and that's a key distinction for me. It's not, I mean, you all have those people in your life, right, that you, you trust them kind of, but you're not going to risk your life on them. Right? It's not that you would never listen to them, because God can speak through Balaam's donkey, right? I mean, you never know who's going to say what needs to be said. But there are just some people in our lives that we know well enough we would never trust them with our lives. That's, how, that's kind of what I mean with nature. I don't think nature is so decimated by, by evil that we can never pay attention to it. It's just we shouldn't be overconfident in it. And one of the ways I feel like Christian theologians in the tradition, not just the Wesleyan tradition, all the way back, have been really dishonest is that they've proof-texted nature in the same way that we proof-text Scripture. You know, you know how proof text works, right? You've, you've got your pet doctrine, and you find the passage of Scripture that proves you're right, and you don't care about anything else in the Bible. You've got, you've got the words that, that assert your accuracy and your authority. And we do that with nature. So you can see, like in the church fathers, when they're wanting to prove one thing, they appeal to animals, that prove, animals who live in such a way that it proves that doctrine true. And when they want to prove something else... They appeal to other animals. So if it's, if it's some kind of practice, like, for instance, um, let's take wolves and sheep. This is pretty familiar. And scripture uses this metaphor often too, right? The, the argument would be sheep are like this. 
and we should be like that. Wolves are like this, and we shouldn't be like that. The problem is, God made both sheep and wolves to be what they are. And the Christian tradition, for the most part, has never owned those kinds of contradictions. And that's a simple one, but there are much more complex ones that have never really been owned, never really been, never really been acknowledged. And they're incredibly damaging and need to be, need to be confronted. There's a, there's a passage. Well, let, let me, man, I'm running out of time. Um, there's this astonishing passage in the Revelation, in the Apocalypse, where in, John, in Revelation 4, where John hears a song. He hears a song that goes like this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. And what's astonishing about that is that it's a kind of quote of Isaiah 6. Isaiah hears a song when he sees the Lord, right? So very similar moments, right? Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. Revelation 4, John sees the throne. They hear songs, but they hear different songs, or they hear a song, a line of the song differently. Isaiah hears, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And what John hears is not the whole earth is full of his glory. Because remember, in the world John inhabits, the world is not full of God's glory. But this is a story about the glory of Babylon being overthrown by God. So the, the, notice the shift. It's not about the earth being full. It's about God being full. And it's a shift away from a spatial metaphor. The whole earth is full of God's glory to a temporal one. God was, is, and is to come. And there's a long treatment in here of the differences between those two songs. But I think those two songs represent two different orientations of Christian spirituality. That there is one that emphasizes the ways in which God has already established his glory in the earth. And there's one that insists the glory is not established in the earth, but God is the one who is to come and will set it right. And of course, what we need is the communion of those visions. Right? Not one or the other, not one replacing the other, but a kind of integration. All right. Thesis five. I'm going to move through several of these quickly. Thesis five. The cross is unnatural. I just made an argument here that um, one of the things that astounds me about the death of Jesus is how little involvement supernatural forces have. I mean, they show up here and there. But you, you get Judas is, is filled with Satan. Satan comes into Judas. But if you watch Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, you get the impression that these people weren't people anymore. That overnight, these people turned into beasts and demons. And they are, if you remember the scene where Jesus is being beaten, he's being lacerated, his skin being ripped off his body, and people are laughing. Not just the guards who are beating him, but the people who are watching are laughing. And the Satan character is walking through the crowd with this kind of menacing grin on his face. But that's not the story the Gospels tell. It doesn't say that Satan entered into Pilate, or Satan entered into Herod, or Satan entered into anyone other than Judas. Jesus was killed by people like you and me doing what they thought they had to do. They weren't out of their heads. They weren't carried away in some demonic frenzy. They were just doing what they thought they had to do. And the Gospels tell us plainly, they're jealous. They're afraid. They're unsure of what it will mean if they let Jesus go. And I think this is absolutely crucial. What killed Jesus was not some, you know, so think about when we talk about Hitler. We immediately go to, he must have been full of the devil. No, he was human. That's what's scary, is that his humanity and mine are the same humanity. If I say he has a demon, I'm deflecting. I'm pushing him away as if he isn't my brother. But he is. And what happened to Jesus happened to Jesus. I mean, think about this. Pilate's the only one we have on record of actually protesting Jesus' innocence. 
Jesus' disciples don't start a riot in the streets saying, wait a minute, don't kill him, he's innocent. I'm sure they thought he was innocent. But you know as well as I know why they didn't do it. Because they knew if they had done it, they would be killed too. So what's controlling Jesus' disciples in that final moment, and Mark's gospel makes this very explicit, is fear. Jesus is not on their minds at all, really. It's what's going to happen to us. And that's exactly what we would do and what we do now. Right? That's, that's the, the point of which I was making about the cross is unnatural. And so we, we need it to help us rethink our natural theologies. Thesis 6. God is not opposed to nature, but God is opposed to evil always and entirely in all manifestations. God is not opposed to nature, but God is opposed to evil always and entirely in all manifestations. So what I I want to suggest here is that without meaning to, we not only suggest that evil is not really that evil, we also suggest that God needs it. And that God allows it because he needs it. And what I want to say is, he doesn't. God is the God who creates out of nothing. He doesn't need anything to do anything. So if you, the example I give in the paper is, imagine a boy who is abused by his father, who, when he grows up to be a man, finds some healing and wants to have a ministry to other abused people. We would be tempted to say God allowed the abuse in the first place because it would be useful later. But we shouldn't say that because God doesn't need that experience for him in order for for God to be able to gift this man with the compassion and gentleness and insight that is necessary, generosity necessary for him to care for abused people. God's gifts are not dependent upon our brokenness. And what evil does to us does not make things possible for God. So God is opposed to evil always, entirely, in every circumstance, in every way. So why don't we see the end of it? Well, let me say this. Um, Wesley loved Romans 5. Suffering produces patience. There are two, at least two ways of hearing that. One is the idea that if you suffer, that will make you patient. You and I both know that's not true. We know lots of people who've suffered greatly who aren't patient. And we know people who are patient who haven't suffered nearly enough. Thank you. That was meant to be funny. No, it's not that. It's, it's not that suffering itself produces Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, not a fruit of our experiences. The fruit of the Spirit is the spontaneous creativity of God, not the outcome of what I experience. So the point in Romans 5 is not that suffering produces patience. It's that suffering in this way in the Spirit yields to patience. That if you suffer in the Spirit... What will happen is your suffering will become patience. Not because the suffering is producing the patience in some kind of straightforward way, but because God is giving rise to the patience in you as you suffer. And one of the things I argue in the paper is it's not that God sends us into suffering. It's that he sends suffering into us. We are collaborating with God in transforming suffering experiences. And... When Christians suffer, there are several reasons I lay out, but one of them, when Christians suffer, they suffer not because God is trying to do something to them, but because God is doing something to the suffering. Okay, almost done. Seven, eschatologically, God ends evil in such a way that all created realities, including historical experiences, are transfigured. So I hear I depend heavily on that line about God being the one who was and is and is to come and suggest that the past is not finished for God yet. None of us knows what our past entails. It's closed for us, but it's open to God. 
So when, when the fullness of time comes, when God presents himself in his fullness, he's not just coming into time to wrap things up. He's happening to time to change what has happened. That the appearing of Christ that the New Testament witnesses to is not an event in a timeline. It's a recreation of the timeline. And in the recreation of the timeline, we don't know what God will do. On the other side of that recreation, we do know we will say, Lord, you are just in all of your ways. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. And when death is destroyed, then we will say, O oh, death, where is your sting? We say it at funerals now, but we shouldn't. Then we will say, death has a sting right now, but it won't then. And in the same way, we can't, except in faith and in hope, we can't say that God is just. It doesn't seem that he is now. But we're the people who are committed to professing it anyway, defiantly proclaiming the way I... I would say it in class at home, is when we say God is good all the time, we're not describing our experience. We're professing our future, a future that lies on the other side of the appearance of Jesus. God is good. Someday that will be true in a way we can't imagine now. Not because he will explain what he was really up to, but because he's still acting on our past. Right? God is still there. This is one of the ways I think we should understand every eye shall see him. Literally. Literally. Every eye shall see him, because he's appearing to all things. Two more. Thesis 8. God sometimes allows us to continue in our sins in order to expose and resist evil in our lives. There's a key, a key difference I'm making in the paper between sins and evil. Evil is nothingness. Sin is human beings trying to free themselves from that nothingness without God. And I'm not going to unpack it all, but... I just do have to tell you about Brother Wright, who is this, I was talking with David the other night. Brother Wright was an older man in our church who wouldn't sit in the pews. He sat, sat in a folding chair over by the wall between the pews and the pulpit and, and mediated the service. And he did that because he was the only one in the church who was fully sanctified in such a way that he could not even be tempted. And he would shut down the sermons or shut down the songs or whatever else he felt like he needed to do. And his name was Brother Wright, which is just spectacular, right? <laughs> that his name was Brother Wright in the middle of all that. But what I, he, he has come to represent for me. By the way, he eventually left the church because he said we were going to end up tempting him if he stayed. Which is probably true. I mean, we were. But the... I think there's a desire for sinlessness that is at the heart of evil. We don't want to be sinless. We want to be holy. The rich young ruler wanted to be sinless. That's why he walked away from Jesus. Sinlessness is not the goal. Paul says, I was blameless concerning the law, but I want Jesus. Right? And I think that the, those are not identical terms. And there's wonderful passages in here from Julian and Thomas Aquinas, but I'm skipping to the last one, which is that God's resistance to evil is experienced now as futility. God is resisting evil now. But what you and I are going to experience is a sense of futility. And what I argue in the paper is that we can and will see victory over evils. But we will not see a victory over evil. We can make real change in the world, and we should work for it. But the soon, as soon as we make real change in the world, evil asserts itself again. And we cannot overcome evil. And so we have to learn to live with a kind of inutility, a kind of futility. And what I call in the, in the paper, spirit-led helplessness. Spirit-led helplessness. There is powerlessness in the blood. There's powerlessness in the blood. So an end.
George Steiner tells this story. George Steiner, you, you, you're familiar with him. He tells a story about God ending the world. God is really, this time, fed up with the world, and he's going to destroy it. Ten days from now, I'm going to destroy it. So the word gets to the Catholics, and the Catholics say, we better get our affairs in order and pray. Maybe God will change his mind. The word gets to the Protestants. I don't know why it got to the Catholics first, but in the story, that's what happened. It got to the Catholics first, then it gets to the Protestants, and the Protestants say, we better get our affairs in order, but let's pray. Maybe God will change his mind. And last of all, the word gets to the Jews. And the rabbis say, 10 days? That's plenty of time to learn to breathe underwater. That's discipleship. I think we've been trying to make disciples because of our natural theologies. And this is explicit in the paper, and I'm having to jump 20 pages at a time. But the... Our natural theologies have led us to the place that we think discipleship is mostly about teaching people how to live in victory. But it should be about how to live underwater. How are you going to learn to breathe underwater? And I think we get this from John Wesley. Now, there is nothing more dangerous than talking about John Wesley to a room full of Wesleyan scholars, especially when you're a Pentecostal and don't really count as a genuine Wesleyan. You all are, my, you know, my bona fides are in question. But I'm just going to read his words and make a couple comments, and then we're going to go home. I heard all of my life, well, long, long time in my life, this line from, attributed to John Wesley that said, Lord, let me not live to be useless. Have any of you ever heard this before? Lord, let me not live to be useless. I did not know until I was writing this lecture what actually is said in that entry in his journal. All of my life, I've heard that, Lord, let me not live to be useless, as Lord, let my life count. Lord, make it so that I don't die in vain, having done nothing for you. Lord, don't let me live and be useless. And then I read the journal entry, in which Wesley's actually saying, talking about a bishop, who prayed that prayer and died the next day. <laughs> In other words, the point of Lord, let me not live to be useless is God kill me before I embarrass myself. And Wesley essentially says, he did, God did, God answered that prayer. <laughs> two years later, and this is a famous letter, two years later, John writes to Charles, and says, in one of my last letters, I was saying that I do not feel the wrath of God abiding on me, nor can I believe it does. And yet, this is the mystery. I do not love God. I never did. This is John Wesley. Therefore, I never believed in the Christian sense of the word. Therefore, I am only an honest heathen. And yet, to be so employed of God and so hedged in that I can neither get forward nor backward... Surely there was never such an instant before from the beginning of the world. If I ever had had faith, it would not be so strange. But I never had faith in any, other, any evidence of the eternal or invisible world than I have now, and that is none at all. I have no direct witness. Now, of course, those of you who've read Wesley's sermons on the witness of the Spirit know what he's saying here. I have no direct witness. I do not say that I'm a child of God, but of anything invisible or internal. Not only do I not know if I'm a child of God, I don't know if there is a God. And yet I dare not preach otherwise than I do, either concerning faith or love or justification or perfection. I find rather an increase, an increase than a decrease of zeal for the whole work of God. I am born along, I know not how, I can't stand still. I want all the world to come to what I do not know. I want all the world to come to what I do not know. Here, Wesley sounds most like Julian, where we started just a little while ago. She says this in one of the most controversial lines in the, in the showings. Our Lord God showed that a deed shall be done, and he himself shall do it, and I shall do nothing but sin, and my sin shall not hinder his goodness working. 
God is going to work. I'm going to sin. God's work is going to triumph. We're Wesleyans. This is not easy for us to hear. But in this way, Wesley and Julian are giving an anti-theology. They're contradicting false pieties and inhumane theologies that suggest that we can be good by our choice since we, after all, were bad by our choice. And that lie will kill our tradition. We didn't destroy things by our choice, and we're not going to redeem things by our choice. Wesleyan theology is not about decisions. It's about transformation. Decisions are about us. Transformations are about God. And God in us. Wesley shows in these words that ministry, faithful ministry, is about being borne along by an energy we cannot claim to be our own in order to help others come to know a God who seems to have abandoned us. If I'm unwilling to be moved by such energy for the sake of such people, is God even alive in me? And that's it. Questions now. I've got a microphone that I will bring around for you to speak into so that uh, we can all hear clearly. Thank you very much, Chris. This is a question from a biblical scholar, actually. Uh, I, 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 uh, when I saw your title, I said to Andy, oh, that's a lectionary. That's, that's so interesting uh, how wisdom works in creation and Trinity Sunday. Uh, so I, but I'm still interested because I didn't really hear you explain it, so I'm still not, I'm not quite understanding. What's the relationship between the wisdom of Proverbs 8 and creation that you, that you see oh, that's yeah. damaged somehow? Yeah, so I think... What, I, what I'm suggesting is that evil is not a creature. It's not a, not a thing. And that's just Christian doctrine, right? And that it asserts itself on creatures. And that most accounts th that we've received say that God creates wisdom first, Proverbs 8. And then wisdom is a metaphor for the ways in which natures are made. right? So God creates everything okay, with a nature. So wisdom is a metaphor for the way God creates. For the way natures work. For the way natures work, okay. Right, so like a tiger hunts and kills and a, you know, a rabbit runs away, right? The, that, what I'm trying to suggest is when you see a nature acting, that's its wisdom. Right, so when the rain, when the rain falls in Manchester, that's its wisdom. When, yeah, go ahead. And do you find a precedent for that understanding of wisdom in the theological tradition? Uh, oh, sure, yeah. The idea that it's what shapes nature, sure. Yeah, that's very familiar. Nature. What's different about what I'm saying that isn't in the theological tradition is the idea that wisdom is what falls first, not Lucifer. Okay. That isn't it. That, that, as far as I know, I don't, I don't know anyone else who said that. But, yeah, I, what I'm saying about things having a wisdom, no, that's not original to me. Thank you for that uh, paper. Uh, clarify the fall of wisdom. Yeah. Um, as some like the idea that it falls first before Lucifer, um, with the idea you went, you kind of touched on it. You know, the the Genesis three narrative is uh, pristine creation that then falls. You kind of not thinking about it that way. Yeah. If I, miss, if I understood that, you yeah, kind so, of alluded to scientific evolution as sort of this emergence sort of thing. So 
I'm wondering about the fall of wisdom along with maybe what the idea of a renewal of creation looks like okay. in what you're saying. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, let me tell you what Wesley says first. I mean, he, he insists that Lucifer's fall comes first and there's no explanation for it. And as he says, Lucifer is self-tempted. So whatever, I mean, that's a new, as far as I know, that's the first time that language gets used in the tradition, that Lucifer is self-tempted. But Wesley then says Adam is not in the position Lucifer was in because Adam is tempted. Eve is tempted first, but Adam and Eve are tempted. So they don't just make a choice in a vacuum like Lucifer did. They make a choice with evil impinging on them, right? What readings, it depends, I mean, they're different. Gregory of Nyssa has a way of reading this that shapes what I'm doing, and Sarah Coakley are the two figures that would be footnoted here that are suggesting that what's happening in Genesis, and, and a lot of Old Testament scholars will, will acknowledge, the Old Testament is not saying that it's a fall narrative. Christians have read it as a fall narrative. But that's not, the text doesn't say that's what it is, right? And I think if you just read the text, what it says is God calls all these things good, and then suddenly, without explanation, we've got a tree that has some kind of evil, a serpent that's tempting, a desire in Eve, a separation between Adam and Eve, all of these things that don't calculate, like we don't know where they come from. And there's no explanation in the text where they come from, right? Christian theologians have always said it came from Lucifer, except for Bart, who we're not going to deal with him, right? The, they always said that it comes from Lucifer's choice. I, what I'm suggesting is it can't, that can't be right, because if a choice is what determined our loss, then a choice is going to determine our salvation and, I, I, and, and a thousand other reasons, right? So I'm rejecting that. I think one thing that Wesley does not consider at all is scientific history. That, I told you about that 1870 critique. The, the, the critic actually brings up Darwin and says, there's a great line in the criticism, in which he says, Wesley spent all of his time reading Milton and didn't read any Darwin, right? That his theology of evil is shaped by this poem, not by an actual study of the history of the world. And I don't think, as theologians, we can afford to do that. Read Milton and Darwin, right? Don't, don't choose. Dar those are metaphors for read poetry and science, right? Um, I don't care if you read Darwin or not, but like, pay attention to what the sciences tell us. And what they tell us is that the history of the world is incredibly violent, right? Long before humans are there to do anything. And I think. We need some account of that. And I think Wesley, to go back to him again, his instinct that what God purposes is in no way violent is right. I think Wesley's right about that. It just needs to be argued in ways that fit our time. Um, but I think his instincts are, are right. Um, but he's in the minority there. Most Christian traditions have said God wanted violence. He just didn't want some kinds of violence. Right? But I, I'm with Wesley. God is against violence itself. And... There, you know, there's a lot weighed, weighed, weighed out there, for sure. Is that helping at all? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on, I know. But. I don't want to hog it. It's just real like 10 seconds. How does that connect with the renewal of creation? Where, where is this? So, part of what I heard at the end is that evil is... I, I didn't hear you say maybe it's in there, but it ends at some point. <laughs> it ends in that God ends it. You know, what we call the, like the New Testament calls the appearing of Jesus. So yes, God absolutely destroys it and ends it. What, I, what I'm arguing is there is our work in history can overcome evils, but only God's appearing can destroy evil itself. Right? So you know, there's that famous MLK line about the arc of history. I don't think there is an arc to history. And it's no matter what we do, evil will remain and assert itself. But God's appearance will overcome evil. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, it's a fascinating paper with a lot of things that I can pick up on. I'm wondering about the, the role of natures in your account. And um, I mean, to be honest, the, the kind of account that you're giving actually reminds me of Tanner and Christ the King. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering. <coughs> the implications of this for your conception of nature and grace. Like, yeah. so she thinks of nature as kind of inherently incomplete and needing to be within grace. Yeah. Um, which, I guess what I'm hearing in terms of resonance between her and you is that by 
moving the problem away from nature itself to something like wisdom, you're actually weakening the way in which nature determines what we are. Yes. And we're actually determined perhaps by something like the call of God to what we should be eschatologically or yep. uh, what we are in grace. Like yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. So there's a passage where I talk about sexuality, and I, I skipped that one on purpose. And if I email you the paper, I'll black that part out so you can't read it. Um, not because I say anything particularly controversial, it's just you never know what's going to offend people. The, but there's, that, there's a famous passage in the culture wars in America about origin, around the idea of original design, that God created people and there's an original design to human sexuality. And they appeal to this passage in Matthew where Jesus says, in the beginning, you know, they ask him about divorce, and Jesus says, in, in the beginning, that's not how it was, right? God, Adam and Eve, and don't separate what God has put together. But we don't go on to read the rest of the passage, which is that Jesus' statement befuddles the disciples, and they say, well, if that's true, we should never marry. And Jesus doesn't disagree with them. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 yes, you should. He just goes right on and says, if you can't hear it, you can't hear it. Some people are eunuchs for the kingdom's sake, and some people are not. And that leads to the little children being brought to him. And that leads to an, another one of these stories where Jesus does the impossible, and that's the rich young ruler, who's for them an exemplary person. And then Jesus says, this man, he has no hope of being saved. And they say, if this man can't be saved, who could be? And Jesus says, for humans it's impossible, but with God it is possible. So I think, I am answering your question, I promise. So like in the American culture wars, they read that passage and what they see are natures. Human nature in male and female sexuality, established by God from the beginning. And we can look at our bodies now and work back to what God purposed. But I think the whole point of the passage is, this is an eschatological change. If you can hear it, you can hear it. If you can't hear it, you can't hear it. And it's the world is turned upside down where children get blessed. So it is very much an eschatological grace transforming nature and fulfilling it that way. Um, the, 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 there's a line in the paper where I say, grace does not violate nature. It renatures nature. So it's what I, what I want to get away from is the idea that grace needs nature. The idea that God makes things a certain way and then his grace is dependent upon those natures acting in a certain way in order to receive grace. Right? God doesn't need anything. That's, that's what I'm coming back to. But you're, you're right to pick up on Tanner for sure. So um, I think a question will come out of this. And if not, just roll with whatever comes Perfect. as a response. But... Yeah. When you pick up wisdom and talk about the, the fall of wisdom, I, I'm wondering about, uh, in the tradition, how many connections have been made between wisdom in the Old Testament, the Logos, theology of the New Testament, the Logos' sure. role in creation, and so then what about Christ's role in creation? I heard some, maybe some pointers, or some Christology in creation, the, the act of, you know, some pointers where you know, I think there's a hint there when you talked about who was and is and is to come. Mm -hmm. And all of that, but just could you expound a little bit on the Christology of creation in what you're yeah, or yeah. Christology in? So we need a conceptual distinction between creation as the act of God and creation as a thing made from that act of God. And we've conflated those two. And because we've conflated them, we can't think about this idea. Right? But this this is not a new to me. I mean, this is a classic distinction. The that says creation for God is not a change. Like, the way we narrate the story, you know, there's God in the eternity past, and depending on what version of the Trinity we've got up and running, it's either, you know, two men and a bird who get bored of being alone, or one old man who gets bored of being alone, and decides to make something. And now he's got something to do. But Aquinas will say, God, creation's not, a, I mean, not, he's not the first, but Aquinas will say, creation's not a change for God. Creation is not an object for God. God has no relationship to creation. Now, to us, that sounds like, what, what could that possibly mean, right? But the whole point is that creation for God is an act that is identical with who he is 
You can't have God acting in ways that aren't fully who he is, right? So I'm not going to, we talk about it more later, but that, that's point one. Point two is, but creation itself, the thing itself does have a beginning. Right? The act of God does not have a beginning. The thing that's made from the act of God does have a beginning. <clears throat> Jesus is the one who does this. Wisdom is the one who does this. This is what's fallen, not this. Like, Jesus is not fallen, right? Jesus is the Savior of what's fallen. But creation as we know it, like in terms of scientific study, what we will find at the beginning of creation is violence. But when we read the gospel, what we find at the heart of creation is Jesus. And that's the difference. That's the already not yet. That's the faith and not sight. That's the, that's the creator-creature distinction. Like that, that's, that's what we're working with here. And I think that in, in our circles, in kind of Wesleyan traditions, broadly speaking, we so conflated the thing creation with the event creation, that we're, our natural theologies are assuming everything that is experienced in the world runs right back to God's purposes. Right? If, if it's, if, because if those are the same, in, in the way that, that I'm explaining it, and again, I'm drawing this right out of Wesley, when we see the tiger kill the villager, we don't praise God. We lament that the world has fallen. We don't say, look at what God did. We say, God, come quickly, Lord Jesus. All right, that, that's what I'm after here. So I think the Christology is, Jesus is the creator right, who's redeeming the creation. And this is where that the point, and I skipped a huge section in the paper where I talked about that line from Julian where she says, God is the midpoint. And God, remember, God is, the Lord God doeth all. God is the midpoint of all. And what I'm after with that is the idea that the heart of creation is the life of God. But that's not, we don't experience that until God reveals himself. I think Io had a question. Thank you very much, Chris. A very stimulating people who start the water like you normally do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect less. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to chew and a lot to think about, but I'm wondering, I mean, from coming from a biblical study point of view, and we talk about the fall of wisdom, I wonder what are the scriptural warrants that you probably have, mm -hmm. the scriptural warrants for the fall of wisdom. Um, yeah. I mean, I may be missing something reading about uh, anthropology, whatever it is, but I, I would like to hear about that a little more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Proverbs chapter 8 traditionally is linked to Christ. I, was, I mean, it's read Christologically. Yeah. But the fall of wisdom as a concept, which is new to me. Uh, new to I, me too, I uh -huh. So I, I'd like to know your scriptural warrant. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a lot. I would say I would start in Colossians. So, and, and it's in the paper, of course, but the... There's this kind of astounding line about how all things are made for Christ and in him, including things visible and invisible, and so on, principalities and powers, that in the very next chapter, Christ exposes as vain, you know, discards them, right, on the cross. So Colossians 1 is these principalities and powers are made for him, and then he exposes them as Lies. Same, same thing happens in 1 Corinthians with if the gods of this world had known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? So what you have in passages like that is this idea that creation is built with powers that function in it. And those powers traditionally have been understood as wisdoms. Like that you've got the wisdom of this world and the God of this world are two ways of talking about the same reality. And the... They, they refer to creatures that are not in allegiance to Jesus Christ, even though they were made for Jesus Christ. And I think you, this gets especially strong where Paul says Jesus is our wisdom. And what he's doing is contrasting Jesus. He's our righteousness. He's our wisdom. He's contrasting Jesus with everything that he's named 
as alternatives to that. Right? He's not the law, but Jesus. Not, th- not righteousness by the law, but Jesus. Not wisdom, but Jesus. He's the wisdom. He's the end of the law. So I think the, a lot of it has to do with seeing Jesus as the wisdom of God as creator, bringing the wisdom of God as creature into obedience. That's, that's what I think the scripture is witnessing to in, in all these various texts. And I think one of the ways you see the need for it is the wisdom literature trajectory. So I, there's a section in the paper where I talk about if you start in Proverbs, Proverbs 8, but, and follow the trajectory, where we end up is Ecclesiastes. And we end up, I mean, in terms of Israel's wisdom tradition, it's Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, who had the most wisdom of anybody, who makes a ruin of his life. Because what he discovers, when he discovers everything about the world, what he discovers is that it's vain, that it's meaningless. And then you go to Romans 8, and we're told that the reason he discovered all was vain is because God has subjected all things to futility. He, God suppressed all things in futility. And Solomon discovers that. And he discovers it because he's not studying God, he's studying the world. But he's not, and Jesus is God, right? So what's happening in Solomon is if you study the things of this world, what you end up with is emptiness. Because the world doesn't witness to God, unless you know God, and then it can if you know God, then you can say, hey, that reminds me of God. But if you don't know God, you, you can't. Right? Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Join me in thanking Chris. Okay, I invite you to stay around for there were some refreshments in the foyer area uh, and have a look at... Uh, the materials in the book stall there. The latest issue of the Wesleyan Methodist Studies Journal just literally arrived today. So if you're interested in uh, having a look at that, that's where the annual lectures usually uh, appear in print. Uh, There's a few copies. uh, If you would put it to good use and you want a copy, um, you're welcome to take one uh, and make a donation if you uh, so wish, but that's... uh, not required. So thank you all for uh, being here and uh, enjoy some time of fellowship now.